Tonight, my conversation with outgoing Chief Judge of New York, Jonathan Lippman, his legacy, his replacement, Janet DeFiori, and how he would reform the criminal justice system, as well as a whole lot more. Also, Baltimore, a city on edge tonight. That, as the judge declares, a mistrial for the first officer on trial in the Freddie Gray case. Then, the controversial affirmative action case that is before the Supreme Court and the even more controversial comments that the ultra-conservative justice Anton, Antonin Scalia has made about it. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to RFL. I am Richard French, and we're going to begin this evening in just a few minutes with a special conversation that I had with a man who has been a major power player in the New York State uh, judiciary for decades, and I'm talking about Jonathan Lippmann. Mr. Lippmann, the Chief Justice of the State of New York and Chief Judge, of the Court of Appeals. He's stepping down at the end of the year, uh, and it's not entirely voluntary. It's because he turned 70. That in May, and that becomes a magic number, the mandatory retirement age. Now, earlier today, I spoke with the judge about that and a whole lot more. I'm curious what's going through uh, your mind right now after seven years uh, serving as Chief Justice. Um, it's a chapter closing, and as I understand, you haven't lost anything on your fastball. Um, you're leaving not necessarily because uh, you want to close this chapter. I, uh, I think it's time, and I'm looking forward to it. But, um, you know, we have an archaic uh, uh, part of our state constitution that was set in 1846 when age expectancy was 40 and uh, that says that you have to retire at age 70 uh, from the judiciary. So, to me, it's silly. You know, they have a constitutional age of a senility. Uh, that being said, the time comes. You remember we had the referendum and yep. uh, it lost. And um, I'm uh, more than looking forward to it. It's a new change in my life. And uh, I do think, though, it's a mistake to putting aside the chief judge, that it's a mistake to uh, diminish the wisdom and experience that you have from uh, judges who have sat on the bench, you know, uh, for many yep. years, have gotten a really irreplaceable experience. And I think that uh, people should be judged on their skills and not on their age. So, uh, but that being said, I look forward to uh, January 1st. And I think that we have a, a very strong uh, successor nominated by the governor, who uh, the viewers of your station uh, know well. Sure. Uh, and she's been a terrific district attorney, and I have absolutely every expectation that she'll be a wonderful, uh, really stellar uh, chief judge. And we'll talk about Ms. DeFiori in a moment, but just to close the chapter on that, in 2013, speaking of the referendum, the governor um, certainly could have been more proactive than he was. Were you a little surprised that... No, I, I think that the... Um, uh, you know, everyone's entitled to their view, and the governor took no public position about it. But, uh, you know, I think we can be very direct that, mm -hmm. that um, uh, the governor has been able, I mean, this in a positive way, not a negative way, has been able to make appointments to the high court, including my successor. I think he's done a terrific job at it. So I don't uh, begrudge the governor in any way for uh, not necessarily being enthusiastic about uh, the proposal, and 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 to be frank, the pro proposal itself was not perfect. Let's talk about your successor. Yeah. What will she be walking into that's better than you found it seven years ago, and what's going to be a, a challenge? For well, I think that's a good question. I think uh, um, that better, I hope, is that we've begun the process of uh, um, making a court that's truly accessible, a court system to everybody, rich and poor, high and low alike. I think we've been able to get uh, the public poly policy of our state, we had a joint resolution of the legislature last year, uh, to be that people in need of legal assistance who are fighting for the necessities of life, the roof over their heads, uh, their physical safety, their livelihoods, the well-being of their families, are entitled to legal representation or at the very least effective legal assistance. On the criminal side, we've, I think, gone a long way to ensuring that justice is not about how much money you have in your pocket and uh, who you know or uh, your station in life. 
So in so many ways, on so many of those topics, I think we've, we've left a stronger, more vibrant judiciary. But are uh, there so many challenges when I say that, that we've made so much uh, progress in access to justice? Legal service providers in the state still turn away more people than they can accept. Uh, on the criminal side, as you indicate, um, you know, that system is still broken. We need fundamental reform. And, you know, on the, the court operation side, we're still recovering from the cuts we had in our budget five years ago. And it's not a question of treating the judiciary uh, 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 differently than the rest of state government. It's what are the dangers of treating it the same as everyone else, mm -hmm. and what do you lose in terms of the rule of law yep. and access to justice? So I think uh, uh, Judge, I still call her Judge De Fiore mm. from the days when she was a judge. I think she's going to have lots on her plate, and I hope and believe that we've left her a system that's, that's moving forward, modern, transparent, uh, the leader in the country. We have a judicial salary commission, which just came out with a report a couple of days ago, which treats judges with respect and dignity. If you could, talk about the difference. I know a lot of people yeah. um, take the robe off, not because they want to, but they, they can't do it anymore with tuitions for kids and everything else. They want to stay a judge, but they got to go in private practice because they were getting, in effect, priced out of the profession. But, but that's, this is a, a night and day difference in terms of that. We've just gotten a report that brings uh, judges, state judges, up to the federal level yep. in a phased kind of a... It'll make a big uh, difference? Oh, tremendous. Um, there'll be 95% uh, of the federal level or two-thirds of the increase they get in the first year or cost of living, then the rest of the increase, then another cost of living. It'll make us competitive with any state judiciary in the country. Because you were losing a lot of good judges, right? Absolutely. It was a disgrace. Mm. Coming back to an issue that we spoke about yeah. before, which was bail reform, yeah. which you led, yeah. um, we profiled tragedies. People yes. of misdemeanors who sat in Rikers for upwards of two and a half years, sometimes with horrible consequences. I know you've worked a lot to move that through, but as you leave the office, how... We'll How screwed up is the system still for somebody who it, doesn't, it, have enough three, it, doesn't have 300 it, bucks in their pocket? The system is broken, period. Um, it needs fundamental reform. It's unfair and unsafe. Unsafe in that judges can't consider uh, um, safe, uh, uh, public safety in the bail determinations and unfair in that um, it is a ridiculous situation when your liberty is determined by how much money you have in your pocket and that someone who can't make $500 in bail uh, is taken away from their family, from their job. Uh, they're forced to take a plea deal, which doesn't necessarily make any sense. So the whole thing is backwards. But I think that we have a lot of momentum on bail reform and certainly juvenile justice, which yep. is really at the lip of the cup. I think that sometimes human tragedies put a human face on criminal justice reform. And in the case of uh, uh, Khalid Browder, uh, the, the poor kid who goes into Rikers, uh, refuses uh, to take a plea, because he stole a backpack, or the allegation is, winds up uh, uh, abused uh, at Rikers and one winds up uh, taking his own life. I think those kind of things have put a focus on bail reform. And I think we have a lot of momentum. And I think it's our role. And the other thing that I've hoped I've left for my really talented successor is a, at least my view, of what judicial leadership is about in this state, and that it's my job to use the pulpit I have as the steward of the judiciary to uh, advocate for reforms of the justice system, to make it uh, uh, more meet the biblical admonition to to justice, ju justice shall you pursue, rich and poor, high and low alike. Well, that philosophy, I think you've termed proactive in the pursuit of justice, yes. um, there's not unanimity. You go to different state courts, as you mentioned here, they got a different philosophy. There's even some criticism from some of the legislative branch in Albany saying, 
hey, there's, there should be a brighter line between legislator and judiciary. Well, let's and talk about Bonacic that. And Bonacic said, hey, sometimes you fudge that line. Well, how would you respond? Uh, well, I, I love Senator Bonacic. He's one of my favorite people. Um, uh, we maybe have a little different philosophy as to how the judiciary should, uh, uh, you know, perform and what judicial leadership is about. My belief is, and you said it, not to be an activist judge different thing. That's usually referred to as for the adjudicative mm -hmm. side, uh, judges who think they write the laws. I don't think that's what the dispute here is about. Um, the Court of Appeals is very, very careful of what we do. But um, on the policy side, I believe it's incumbent upon judicial leadership to be proactive in the pursuit of justice because we know about the justice system and it's not being a legislator to propose uh, a legislation that has to do with the justice system because what happens is the ills of society reflect themselves in the courts every day. We can't put our head in the sand and live in a vacuum separate and apart from what's happening in a society. Well, it's a perfect segue, that tension, if you will. Uh, we don't live in a vacuum, as you say. Obviously, um, we've seen what's happened right down at Foley Square in the last month between Shelley Silver, I understand was childhood friend, uh, the Assembly Speaker, former, and also the former Senate Majority Leader as it related with Dean Skelos. There was questions that the U.S. Attorney, the supporters will say, you needed um, somebody that was going to be the voice of change here, that was going to drive what was an intractable system. The critics say that he was going outside the four corners that you just mentioned and that he was litigating the case in the press well, before the trial even started. Let me, let me just say that, that uh, look, this is an issue of great interest to all New Yorkers. Number one, in the judiciary, when you talk about your the yeah. lies, we don't talk about pending cases. Remember, there are still appeals pending sure. in this. But certainly, and, and certainly, uh, we don't critique, you know, what happens in those kinds of cases. But do I think it's critically important that every branch of government have the public's confidence and that we have effective uh, um, uh, ethics laws and, and we have prosecutors and uh, uh, conduct commissions or whatever it is and public entities that ensure uh, the integrity of, of, of our state government and our, you know, and all of the branch. Absolutely. And I think that's a, you know, a, a critical issue. This next one is obviously macro because you go from municipal judges all the way to the highest court. But by and large, do, ju do judges have too much or too little discretion? My view, too little. That, that I think particularly on the criminal side, there are cases where um, they're, they're hamstrung in what they can do, whether it be sentencing or some of the uh, other areas. I think that judicial discretion is critical. Um, and to, to tie the judge's hand, whether it be um, uh, about bail, for instance, where judge can't consider public safety is ridiculous. I mean, mm. I can't think of anything sillier in our statutory uh, yeah. laws. Or you talk about I have proposed changes in the sentencing laws to to let the judge determine the sentence, and not like now we have these sentencing ranges and the parole board determines what someone's sentence is, and the parole board these days are subject to. Uh, political football and the political wins. We need uh, sentencing that has the judge set the sentence and not these huge spans. So those are the kind of things where my belief is that, that the judges do not have uh, sufficient discretion and by their names, not to have a play on word, uh, their judges be they have good judgment. That's that's what they're trained to have good judgment. So why won't you allow them to do their jobs? What won't you miss, whether it's schlepping up and down the throughway, whatever, and what is it going to be tough when you finally turn off the lights? What is it going to be? That well, you I'll, miss the I'll tell you, the, the, uh, I won't miss going up and down the throughway. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's for sure. What, I, what really, though, I think that, will, uh, that I won't miss also is having the weight of the world on my shoulders every day. You know, you, you, you're guiding a justice system that has a $2.5 billion budget and 20,000 yeah. employees and 3,600 judges and, and the fate of human beings 
every day in your hands, and I feel from a paternal uh, respect, you know, responsible for everything that happens in justice system. I, I won't miss, uh, you know, having that, that weight off my shoulder. What I will miss is the people. But I don't intend to be far away from the judiciary, uh, from all these people that I've spent my, my life with and uh, feel good about it. And again, I feel good and I, and I, as you may know, I say what I think. Uh, I have great confidence that the judiciary is going to be in very good hands. And, uh, and I feel that way yeah, well, very strongly. Congratulations on a good run, and thank you so much for, for the time today. Thank Appreciate you, Richard. It. My pleasure. All right, coming up next, we're going to bring in our panel of attorneys to talk about the legacy of the outgoing judge. And, of course, we'll be focusing on the developing situation in Baltimore after the mistrial came down earlier today. Stay with us.